Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of How to Fight. You all seem to have been enjoying these, so we're back with a third one. And today, it's How to Fight Steven Seagal's character. Oh, shoot. What's his name? Andrew, this is the part where you help me out every time. Nico. <laughs> his name is Ni Nico. 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 Tuscany, I believe. Tuscany in Above the Law. I think we've all had this this conversation almost exactly as is, but this time you're going to listen to three others talk about it because who hasn't talked about fighting Steven Seagal? And so I'm I'm joined by Andrew. Andrew, you're back. We recorded this morning. We're recording again. Thank you for for being back and also back from episode 602, Matt King. Matt, hey, you must have had a good time talking, or at least didn't hate me. So because you're back, Andrew invited you back, and you came back. Yeah, I mean, try try something twice just to make sure. <laughs> I, yes, yes, awesome. Well, you picked this movie. I did. You wanted to talk about this movie, and of course, this character. Because who else are you going to talk about fighting in in Above the Law? But this movie, why? Why did you want to do this movie? I was uh, talking with Andrew, and I really enjoyed the first episode you guys did hmm. for the Perfect Weapon. Um, talking about uh, the previous episode and it just seemed like to me it was one of the very iconic mm. martial arts movies that if you didn't see when you were younger you definitely saw at some point and you whenever you saw it you have an opinion about it <laughs> and that opinion is good bad ugly, well, whatever it's important because it's one of those movies that it is when you have a conversation about martial arts flicks, it's got to come up. It's going to come up. Yeah. And it was that or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Those are the only two oh. options I had to start out with. So oh. I got to come back for another episode. <laughs> we might get so much hate if we talked about how to fight literally any of the Ninja Turtles. Yeah. Oh, my mind is racing. All right. Pulling it back, Jeremy. Andrew, <laughs> when, when did you first see Above the Law? Um, so it came out in, what was it? 88. I yeah. Think. I think I saw that. Um, I would have been, it would have been the year before I started training. So I would have seen it in high school as most, okay. most of these eighties martial arts movies. Um, so it would have been, you know, that I would have rented mm. it at the local video store, uh, when those things existed, but that's when I would have seen it. Nice. Nice. All right. Uh, what, I, what I'm attempting to, to ask Matt is your feelings on Steven Seagal but I'm trying to do it in a, in a kind respectful diplomatic way because he, he's become a bit of a polarizing figure within the martial arts completely could not agree more uh, I think that it's also important uh, like in, in movies like this in particular um there's a lot of like death of the artist mm. that gets brought up that like this movie can be viewed or loved, hated, however you feel about it, independent from, you know, now 30 years later, um, what a person may have become. And mm. I think that, you know, when you, when you have a figure like this, who certainly not single-handedly, certainly not without the help of some incredible other people. Uh, Seagal is someone who brought Aikido to the masses, and it's one of the most yep. popular martial arts in the world. So many people practice it. And, you know, O-sensei in his, you know, brilliance kind of took the idea of martial art, you know, post-war time and yeah. was able to take kind of a, a Koryu mindset of Daitoru Aiki Jiu-Jitsu and Kenjutsu and swordsmanship and kind of translate that into an art that could be done by the masses for a million different reasons. There are some people who practice Aikido with no intention to ever fight, and that's perfectly fine. And there are some people who practice Aikido with the intention to have a rigorous self-defense regimen. Mm -hmm. And in some way, especially if you're American, but in a lot of ways, if you've ever seen movies or are part of a culture that's been touched by cinema, uh, like you got to give a nod of the hat to Seagal. Yeah. Yeah. He came through and he, he started doing things differently. 
the fight scenes in this movie are transitional because of their speed. It's the first time, to my knowledge, Aikido was on screen. And this was, if I remember correctly, his first movie? First movie. Correct. Okay. Yep. Now, I'm one confused. of the... Now, um, we did two other episodes that, that viewers or listeners may want to check out. Episode 97, where I did a profile of Seagal. I remember sitting at this desk way too late at night because I, I, for some reason, had put it off. I don't know, maybe because it was Seagal, maybe because I was just putting it off and just digging in and, and putting together a script. And then on episode 458, Professor David Meyer came on and he'd actually met Seagal before he was an actor. He stepped into his dojo and we got a little bit of behind the scenes. So if anybody wants to go deeper on the subject of today's conversation, I would encourage you to check out those two episodes. The one other thing I think that's important to mention before we move forward and, and talk about the movie, what we like and don't like, et cetera, is that Steven Seagal is a legitimate Aikido practitioner. He was the first Aikido uh, instructor in Japan of American descent. Right. He he was the first one. And at, if I'm remembering and of course, you know, episode 97, I, I didn't re-listen to it or anything. But I want to say even back then he was a fifth Don like guys got some some legit cred. Yeah, he is uh, for for whatever it is you want to take from current events or or other decisions or his movie career. <laughs> um, and he's, he's a he's a fully three dimensional person, you know. People can do all sorts of stuff with their life, their career, their skills. Yeah. Um, that that guy had talent. And when you're, you know, six and a half feet tall and rather, you know, lithe and athletic and you have a lot of rigorous training, uh, that guy was no joke. Right. Right. Andrew. Yep. Do you like this movie? I was... It it oh. was just it was just an okay movie Ooh, for me. okay it, it was it was i it is not what i would call a good movie okay why do you say that um, what is it lacking other than than poor taekwondo skill expressed <laughs> poorly with poor acting aside, alongside it um i just felt like a lot of the movie wasn't believable just mm. the plot, the story. I don't think the acting was particularly good. Um, You're expecting good acting in a martial arts flick from the 80s? I know, I know, I know. But I mean, it just wasn't one that I was like, I just didn't love it. I don't know. It, it, dis despite you having watched it around a similar time as others that you hold dear, yep. this one just didn't do anything for you. Correct. Then or now. Okay. Yep, yep. I get that. Matt, how about you? Uh it's a movie that I uh, enjoy watching once every five years mm. uh, just for kind and 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 this is I, I mean this in kind of a, an endearing way. Uh, I've got friends that I watch movies with that we go out of our way to find like schlock horror mm. or B list movies or like we go out of our way to find movies that may not be perfect or we may have issues with if we compared it to a, a major blockbuster or or something else which this movie is not it it, it has it has plot holes it, it like the entire believability of going from you know foreign national to cia op to pop <laughs> spoiler alert for anybody who just hasn't watched the movie yet um like it's just it you can tell that someone and and it is the case with this movie that um Seagal had the ability to and was with the director like they rewrote the movie mm -hmm. to take it from LA they put it in Chicago they changed some things around um but it the one thing that I think it's really missing and this is something that I think is always present in martial arts movies and it's almost like it, it's like a Chekhov's gun type of thing for me in martial arts movies. It does not have the conservation of ninjutsu mm. where there is not a scene where anyone's posing any threat to him ever. And like 15 guys come in and he knocks down 14 of them. 
and now you've got a fight scene. He took, <laughs> he walked through everyone so easy. It was just yeah. not endearing. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, you, you, you point out the fun of some of these bad movies. Sometimes movies are enjoyable or, or worthwhile, not because of what they are, because what they provide. And this conversation is a good example. You know, you think about your, your cheesy horror movies or, you know, any movie where you watch it and you think, you know, mystery science theater could have done this film, you know, that sort of thing that there's value there. And, and I, I completely get it. And I just have to say, if you have the opportunity to kiss Sharon Stone and you lay down what was one of the weakest on-screen kisses I've ever seen in my life. I mean, that was the part I was kind of reeling from. I, I had not seen this movie, at least not for a very long time. I don't remember. I'm sure I did, because I remember my mother having a crush on Steven Seagal when I was a kid. So <laughs> I know we watched Above the Law. I know we watched Under Siege. Like, I remember these things. But... They were in bed and laying there and he kisses her and I'm just like, ugh. Like, what's going on there? Now, we're not going to unpack that because that's not what we're here for. What we're here for is to talk about the fights. So, Matt, what was the first relevant thing that you saw as, as we start to see Nico, the character's skill unfold that's relevant to this conversation? Uh, I think one of the, the, whenever I think of this movie, I immediately go to, and I almost stay in the opening scene when he's teaching in the dojo mm. in Japan, uh, and he's giving instruction in Japanese, and uh, I we always think about it because the, uh, the pants he's wearing, the Hakama uh, in Aikido, you, we wear like a gi pant underneath your mm. Hakama, which is one way to wear those pants. Um, but the way he sits down kind of slapping the yeah. Hakama out of the way, uh, <laughs> it's just a bold statement to do that. Uh, so it's when, you know, when, when I'm training and we're teaching people to move the Hakama out of the way in a different way, we will often reference that part. <laughs> <laughs> That's completely besides the question. It's just my favorite part of the movie and it's what gets referenced most mm. often to me. Um, but it's when he's trying to explain when Seagal's character, Nico, is explaining to people and, and showing them the technique. And I, I've, I've taken Aikido before. Uh, and it, it was it, when you see it, it's just kind of like, oh, yeah, that just feels like a dojo. And an instructor is up there with one of the senior students and they're running through a technique and they kind of just clap their hands. And now it's your turn. Don't throw anybody into anybody else. <laughs> and you go from there. But I remember the first the first real demonstration where it looks like there's something going on. He, uh, it, it's right before he does a knife disarm, mm. and I thought one of the most iconic things about this movie, you know, seeing it with eyes now, is everything. Everything used to be so fast. Oh my god, it was so quick. It was so tight and precise and technique. Uh, now, whenever I think Aikido, I think these big sweeping motions and these big circular motions stealing someone's momentum to create the impetus for another technique. But in this movie, everything's in this tiny little box right in front of like yeah. a strike zone from like nose to bottom of his chest and took someone's knife away. And that knife becomes a very important part in the rest of the movie. It does. It does. Yeah, that that first scene or that that first let's call it fight, not that it was much of a fight, really does set the tone because it's just it's so abrupt. It's so bam, he's just it's there, it's over, it's done with. And I don't have anything to go on with this, but my suspicion is that knowing the little bits that that I've picked up about Seagal from doing episodes of the show with people who knew him or knew of him, knew people, mutual friends. He wanted to step in and change things. He wanted to leave a mark. And so that that scene and really the rest of the scenes, they're they're quick. They're not the standard fight scenes that we see in martial arts films that are dragged out. You know, that the the 15, 14 of the henchmen or 
you know, reduced to a pile and then you get 20 minutes of back and forth. And at the last moment when it looks like it's all over, you know, he's victorious. <laughs> Definitely. So, Andrew, anything to add there early on? Because we really, if, from my notes, we have like, like four fight scenes. Yeah, basically. Yeah, there, there weren't a lot of fight scenes in the movie, as, as you mentioned. Um, that opening scene, and and actually, I would say probably throughout, the thing that I noticed is that Nico really loves to clothesline people. <laughs> that is yeah. his, without a doubt, that's his go-to move. Like, in that opening sequence where he, you know, he took down, I don't know, I didn't count, but roughly seven or eight, you know, he did seven or eight techniques. Mm on different people there were six of them were clo- were ended with a clothesline i mean he would do some sort of technique beforehand but it was it ended with a clothesline so it was something that uh, that he he really loves his clothesline he he enjoyed those i wonder how much of that is because of aikido technique and how much of that is because it's a safe way to finish a movement with a low to moderately trained actor without really injuring them pretty much anybody that's bigger than you can throw an arm across your chest and fairly believably put you down well that that a rimi nage technique where he's He's throwing japanese terms in all right i'm I'm feeling schooled (laughs) Uh, that that entry throw technique is usually a technique where you see there being like a tenshin like there's a a pivot that Mm. the person who's throwing is doing and you're entering in behind them and kind of raising the head and offsetting their balance. Sure. And from this movie, if we could take this as like the first video representation of Seagal doing this to when you watch him, when videos of him come out now in 2021, he does that technique the exact same way Mm. off of a reverse punch, someone stepping straight (laughs) in and he parries out of the way and he does not care about lifting your head up and breathing in and then exhaling and dropping your your the back of your head over your heels it just straight up pops you with a bicep and you're falling down it's there's no there's no real way to absorb that hit very well and also he's always taller than everyone he fights in every movie and that's a real easy technique to do if you're taller than someone yeah i don't think i'm pulling that off but if you can, it mm. would be epic. I, I've True. trained with people who are a foot shorter than I am. And when the techniques are there, it is so god awful disruptive. But if you're that much taller and have that much more reach on someone, especially when it's in a you know a stuntman to actor relationship, he's just dropping people left and right. Yeah. Andrew? Um yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't there's not much else to say. It, it it's that that's just how he did it. I mean, he, and it's tough to find. It is definitely easier to do those types of techniques when you are so much taller than yeah. than the other people around you. So, I mean, it makes it makes sense. How did you feel about Nico as a character played by someone who, intentionally or not, is kind of representing Aikido, which has a bit of an ethos that we all tend to think about. Did you feel like that was consistent? Was Nico an Aikido practitioner philosophically? Are you, are you asking me? Yes, you're yeah. Andrew. Okay. Um, I didn't. I didn't. I haven't studied Aikido enough to know of the you know know much of the philosophy. Um, I do know that he seemed very quick to be angry. Yeah. Uh, he got angry very quickly. Although I noticed that he unlike Jeff Speakman's character from the movie Perfect Weapon, uh, when Nico got angry, he still was very calm, which which was something that you don't necessarily often see. You could tell he yeah. was angry and he you know and it didn't take much to get him there, but right. he kept an even keel as he was dealing with his anger. Yep. I I had some pretty strong reactions to him just getting angry and and I spent some time thinking about it. I actually paused the movie at one point to think about it. And what I got to was, I don't know how much of it is anger and how much was calculated and decisive action that he felt needed to be taken. Hmm. 
Interesting. Yeah. And the other note I had next to that, what, what's with all the revolvers? Why was everyone in this movie carrying a revolver? Yeah. And they were all apparently uh, Steven Seagal insisted on teaching all of the actors to draw the, 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 in, in his, in his, the correct way, like his, his way, the way that like the best way, apparently. What, what was the one, where was it? I've got, I've got a note. It was at the, and, and we'll, we'll cut this in here just after the hour mark at, at an hour and a minute. A guy walks in, and I'm I'm not going to put a gun on on YouTube, but he was like holding it, like muckling on, like he had like a finger through the trigger guard, and he's got his hand is just like wow, like he, you know what it looked like? It looked like, you know, the claw machine games. Oh yeah, it looked like he did that with his gun, <laughs> and I just I stared at it. it. Was it was it was terrible? All right, so we're we're unpacking who Nico is and, and his fighting stuff. What did you guys notice about and Matt? We'll start with you. What did you notice about Nico and how he fought? That's relevant to this conversation of how to fight him. Uh, I think that it's uh, maybe a, a misnomer about Aikido. Also maybe part of that, that ethos mentality um, that, in the what you what I would consider the fight scenes when there's when there's actually fight that is around for a purpose. I think with the exception of like one punch that he threw at some guy uh, and hit him in the stomach and knocked the guy down, <laughs> and he just happened to be a very big guy on set, and you know yeah. that was just they they warped that guy to show just how powerful Seagal is and Nico was. Um, the there wasn't really any. Uh, attacking that he did to start the fight. Mm -hmm. It was either uh, someone was just extending a hand towards him and he was attacking off of that, or it was someone recklessly with absolute abandon trying to attack Seagal mm. and it, it didn't ever work out. Go figure. Um, <laughs> there, there was a lot of... Um, posturing there was a lot of waiting around but then when things started happening there was like you were saying there was a lot of decisive motion nothing was drawn out everything was meant to uh immediately cripple subdue mm. and put someone down which not a bad way to go no probably techniques that police officers would use <laughs> i ironic statement <laughs> um given given that mr seagal uh, is a, I forget what county in Louisiana sheriff. Oh yeah. Cook. I don't remember what county, but I, I, I don't remember, but there's a whole, there's a whole series. There's three seasons of that series that you can go watch. But if you want to watch something that's better, it's, um, Oh, who's the comedian that does the impression and talks about it. Oh, uh, ooh. <sighs> Jason, uh, something Segura. Yes. Tom, Tom, Tom Segura. Tom Segura does this absolutely phenomenal yeah. uh, impression. If, if anyone wants to to watch that, um, make sure you've you've visited the bathroom recently because you'll need it. <laughs> it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Yeah, it, it would be hard not to pee your pants while watching it. It's yeah. so funny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Andrew, what? Give me some stuff that you you picked up that. So I we need to watch for. You know, as Matt mentioned, you know, 98% of his stuff was all parry counter, mm -hmm. parry counter. But it wasn't like counter with a punch. It was definitely a throw of some sort. And every technique that I saw that came at him to attack him was from his belly to his head. Like every single attack was in this little window right here. Yep. That was it. And it was always parry, do some sort of technique to get the opponent off yeah. balance. Uh, and then 90% of the time, hit him with a clothesline. And it was straight on every time. Yeah. It was yeah, all yeah, facing him. There was nothing. Yeah. You know, there were several points in the movie where something was going on behind him. 
And it all just stopped and waited for him to turn around. Turn around. And then they would attack him. They'd wait. You know, absolutely. Yep. You know, that 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 square up. You know, one thing I saw that um, if if I were to see this, you know, let's say I'm going to fight. I'm going to have like a fight with Nico. And I'm, this is part. This is my my tape that I have to watch and prepare for the scene where he punched through the car window oh my God. with no impact to his hand, like no blood, nothing. And then managed to grab the guy around the neck from that awkward, terrible shoulder rendering angle and just choke him out and lift him up because we have to, suspend disbelief with our format here on how to fight we have to take that as canon that this character is capable of doing that i would imagine then that steven seagal could choke slam me in a way that uh the undertaker and kane from professional wrestling would find very enviable yeah not steven seagal nico toscani nico could certainly do that nico can <laughs> Seagal can't. Hidden powers of like, you know, yeah. CIA tactics. I noted that cars from the late 80s are very boring. You know, and and at least with the karate kid, when Mr. Miyagi broke the window, like he had tons of room. He had enough room to get, yeah. get power, get force behind it. Like I legitimately believe someone could break a side window with a punch. I think that's, I think that's, uh, Mr. Miyagi didn't do it. Uh, sorry, Martin Cove character did it, mm -hmm. right? But Nick Toscani, he only had about, what, a foot? Yeah, of just range to break. Boom. So for sure, he's superhuman he in is. terms of his power. That's he for is. Sure. It's not looking good for any of us. Yeah, no. that's fair. Not with that right hand. <laughs> uh, not too long after we end up with this sequence where we learn he knows swords. He has no problem standing in between two people. And he's an immensely fast runner. I mean, when he was chasing down that guy, I mean, the stamina. I mean, just... Woof. Well, he is tall, though, as well. That helps. It, it, it does, but he was running fast for a while. I mean, that's... Yeah. That was one of the only scenes that had, like, a lot of cuts in it, mm. too. Like, they weren't, they weren't too... Uh, uh, liberal with the amount of cuts they did in the movie, but those right. running scenes had plenty. And I was wondering, I'm like, are they just like sprinting for like 50 feet? And then you're just like, okay, cut. We'll, we'll go back tomorrow. Um, or, you know, and he, I mean, Seagal at the time, like he was in pretty good physical shape. So they, it's very possible that yeah. he was all out sprinting after another human being trying to get away from him. Completely possible. Uh, uh, the that weapons fight scene, though, yeah. has, has like the best moment in the film when the car full of bad guys rolls up on him mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, we know where your friend is. And they pull out a gun and point it at him. And he's like six or eight feet away from the car. And it's the most true reaction <laughs> of someone. It's like. Oh, okay, roll credits. Like this is where the movie ends, and instead yeah. they do the typical: "We're not going to shoot you. We're going to beat <laughs> you to death and get out of the car with numerous weapons." That now you just know. Yeah, um, this is how this is going to go. What a what a good time! What a great time <laughs> that was. Did you notice that he didn't miss with a firearm? He was absolutely flawless, flawless with a gun. I mean, there was some stuff in the parking garage where. You know, he wasn't quite on target with some of, but earlier it just bing, 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 bing. You know, it was like he was having target practice while lead's flying around and missing him. I didn't even think about it until you just said that. The the scene that he ends, the scene right before he ends up on the car that he one hand just like baby smacks through and breaks, he got hit by the car. That's how he ended up on top of the car. Yep. Like he is superhuman. He's fine. <laughs> oh my he's, god. He's fine. Um I don't have anything else in my notes that's that's relevant to how to how to fight him. It's all jokes. I've got a lot of jokes here. Yeah. 
and but that's that's my job that you know like my way for fighting him like are we getting into that now because like yeah I, I let's let's go there like what would your strategy be andrew i'm i'm running at him like this mm. with my, my for, for those that are only listening my hands are up blocking my head so that he can't clothesline me that's it because mm. otherwise you know i, I just got to be able to block the clothesline that's all that's that pretty simple job. yeah yeah okay matt how would you fight Nico? I'm not going to go the Occam's razor method that Andrew is choosing. Mm. I, will, I would go more complicated. Uh, and I think boxing him would actually be a more significant way of kickboxing him. Uh, because whenever he is attacking, or whenever, whenever he's being attacked, it is someone who is unapologetically entering his range. And there is never any tentative feeling out. There's never any gauging of range. And like Andrew was saying, it's just parry counter, parry counter, parry counter. Um, parrying a jab is fine. Countering a jab and trying to throw off a jab is incredibly difficult. Yeah. It's it, If you're not really throwing your lead hand to make contact, as soon as you touch it, now I know where you are. And now something else can turn around. And... I, I mean, I'll, I'll join Andrew and eventually you get close enough that it can become more difficult or it can become a, a more, what we consider more of a legitimate grappling or wrestling situation. Now, I'm not sure what you guys would, would think of this. You know, I'm the smallest of the three of us. You know, he's got close to a foot on me. We didn't see how he dealt with any kind of thrown weapons. So I would, because I wouldn't want to get close to him, I would try to throw irregular objects at him. You know, what, how does he handle throwing a rock at him? Uh, how does he handle, you know, having whatever hurled at him? I would definitely not square up with him. We saw how that worked out. I'm done. So it's about angles. It's about the side. It's about getting to the back. And it's about staying out of arm's reach. His arms are probably about as long as my legs. So that's not really going to work out well for me i'm going to need the element of surprise or i'm going to have to charge in with some kind of slipping you know step behind step up sidekick to the knee sort of deal and a hope that i buckle his leg enough that he's not so interested in, in grabbing me with his ultra strong thor-like hands <laughs> Yeah, I my real answer would have been some stuff that has to do more with the legs. Mm. Um, like I think Matt's idea of boxing is a smart one, you know, keeping your guard up, you know, because this does uh, no joke aside like this does help, you know, stop that that uh, that sure uh, uh, clothesline. But like, you know, we never saw him defend his legs at all, like just taking out the those, you know, tree, hit those tree trunks super hard i'd be interested to see how that would work on him yeah but you're right staying out of his reach would 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 be good as well i i would i would really more than you know the others other two episodes that we've done i would be looking for some kind of ranged implement you know broom handle something to attack his legs at a distance because i i don't know what else i would do yeah this guy's My a monster one. He somehow backed a car through a wall at the perfect balance point that the guy fell off, but the car didn't. I mean, it's almost magic. <laughs> My wife often, she always watches these movies with me and she, she enjoys it. She, you know, she's not a martial artist herself per se. She's, you know, she does some cardio kickboxing stuff, but you know, she enjoys the, the, the thought process of breaking down and watching what these people do. And her response to how she would fight him is she's like, I can't figure anything out because I can't get past the hair. The hair and the sideburns and everyone's mullet. She's like, I just, I can't fight them. I can't get over it. Yeah. It's a great point. And, and maybe that's what was going on. Maybe everyone that faced him, maybe that's why he turned to face everyone. Oh. He was just it's it, maybe maybe there was something that couldn't quite be captured on film, you know, just kind of radiated. That could be. And they were transfixed. Captivating stare. Yeah. <laughs> Medusa for level. the modern times. Very high level Aikido technique. Captivating Abs stare. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Anything else that we should add? Anything 
Anything from anybody's notes, anything that, that fleshes out this conversation more before we wrap it up? Um, the only thing I would say is this movie was filmed in entirety in two months. That long. <laughs> yep. Oh, I had one more thing here that, that I didn't say. Because everything we saw of him was defense, one of the best strategies would involve unexpected attacks, non-traditional, oh, non-squared, you know, weird angles. You know, think about those techniques that we train where you're like, it's not a bad technique, but when I don't know when I would ever use that. Those, those are the ones that you want to use. Capoeira. Capoeira would probably be great for this. Jenga one, Jenga two, Jenga three, bam. And he's like, what just happened? You just have, you have to have enough weight behind it to, to overpower him. I'm good with that. Well, <laughs> you, you've got a little more ballast than I do, my friend. <laughs> I think, I think it's awesome to think too, that for, for anything you can say about Seagal in this movie, filming the final scene when he got punched across his face, his nose actually broke. Oh. Uh, and they yep. cut, they rushed to the hospital, and they set it, and he spent all night with an ice pack on his face so they could finish filming the scene the next day, and he wouldn't have two black eyes. So oh, like, what a riot. Guy, yep. The guy can take a punch, even if it also broke his nose. <laughs> Uh, but he was, he was worth doing. Uh, I thought w one of the things that Andrew was saying was actually very interesting. The the transitions and if you were able to change levels on him, or like you were saying, Jeremy, if you could get in and, and actually take someone down, uh, you know, tie up a leg, shoot a leg, mm. pick an ankle, something like that, something that would arrest his ability to, you know, change the distance on you. Um, this is, uh, it's interesting because it, I don't think it's a topic that usually gets brought up in Aikido um, or, or in a lot of, um, and not necessarily, maybe in a lot of more traditional arts that don't focus or have more of an MMA mm. type approach. Sure. But the majority of the techniques you can do standing, you could do on a knee. And of course, you do yeah. On a knee, you should probably be able to do them or at least figure out a way to do them uh, in, in some regard from a prone position or, or at least on, on the back, uh, there's an Aikido, two Aikido teachers that I've been fortunate enough to train with who actually wrote a book called uh, Aikido and Ground Fighting. Mm. And it focuses nice. a lot on this transition of distance and how to, how to use, the ba use the principles and the ideas that you're learning in Aikido to generate your force and keep momentum going, keep an opponent off balance and transition into different distances and ranges and it was just it dawned on me when you were saying that that mm -hmm. there, there are people who maybe had an idea and were like that's how i would have fought nico too and they were like not <laughs> gonna they, catch and, me they, like wrote yeah. they, they wrote a book yeah they don't have his it. powerful right hand they had to figure oh. out how to grapple and... not that it's relevant in in our in our format here but he also all of his attacks were attackers came at him one at a time yep I don't think he would do so well at simultaneous combat. You know, simultaneous combat really does offer or, or give preference just logistically to striking and his propensity to, to lean from striking to, you know, more, more grappling jujitsu, manipulative, manipulative body weight, whatever you want to call it collectively, which is Aikido. Um, there's probably an, probably an Aikido book on that too. I wished that we had seen more, and all all of the scenes where there were fights in them, it was bars, it was uh, the little like bodega mm. uh, corner market. Um, when you watch some people do like Aikido Rondori with multiple attackers, like he did in that opening scene in the dojo, where he's having different people come and attack on him one of the tactics you try and learn is if you have two people coming at you on two 45 degree angles, you try and move in a position where one would have to cross the other person's right. path with the fact that there were many scenes with many different attackers. I wish they had incorporated that dynamic because there, it was very stagnant. Sure. Well, there was the one scene where he was in between two people. 
So the one time we saw anything close to it, he did not do that. Yeah. Yep. 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 So you need a friend. If you have you, a friend, you, you do can need a friend. Nico Toscani. I don't think Nico had any friends. I don't, yeah. Even his partner and his wife didn't seem to be his friends, yeah. which is but a shame. Let's just talk about uh, Pam Greer, though. Won, won an award for it. She knocked it out of the park. Did she win an award for that? Yeah, she was, oh, I didn't uh, was a Best Supporting Actress. Uh, yeah, I believe for, so. And she still She was great. It. She was amazing. And she still talks about it. It was one of her favorite roles because it showed a range of mm-hmm. acting that in previous roles she had never been able to showcase. Nice. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, any any final thoughts as we wrap up here? Anything for the, the audience to consider? Aikido is awesome. Aikido is fun. Yeah. Uh, I would highly recommend to anybody. I came from a very uh, Kempo, New England Kempo, which is kind of a, a, an offshoot of karate, like shoulder new, uh, a very kind of linear-ish mindset. Mm. And when I started training Aikido, uh, it it threw me. It didn't make sense. I was <laughs> coordinated, um, but I had a teacher that uh, we shared training sword together, and I got to train with him so much. And for me, the most important thing was I just that that willful suspension of disbelief that I'm I'm in this pedagogy now. Hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna move like this. I'm gonna think like this. I'm gonna breathe like this. Uh, it made all of my training better. Sweet. It it made understanding motion, uh, the understanding motion and the concept of motion and movement with another body in space and timing, so much better. And then you try and take what you can and learn to fight with it or learn to use it. Uh, but if people can do it, I mean, especially people who grapple or just kickbox or anything, it is such a cool art to learn and learn it and then use it to fight Steven Seagal. Right on. <laughs> Cool. Andrew, anything else? Uh, uh, my final words would be uh, just like in our The Perfect Weapon, uh, if Steven Seagal watches this and would like to come on and talk about Nico Toscani, I would more than encourage him to do so. I think we would, we would gladly do a follow up with Mr. Seagal if he was interested. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Do well, it on Russia's time because that's where he currently lives. Well, you know what? There, there are very few people for whom I would open up the, the schedule time wise and and record at weird times. He is one of them. You're an angel, <laughs> Matt. Thanks for being here. Appreciate thanks. you coming on. So, to the audience, you know, what did you think? Did did we miss something? Do you have a completely different strategy? We will entertain any and all conversation other than anything that is disrespectful or derogatory towards either Mr. Seagal or Aikido, because you know what? We've heard it all before and it's not worth hearing anymore. Okay. If you've got something new to say to attack Mr. Seagal or Aikido, I'll listen to that at least for novelty's sake. If you want to go deeper on this or any episodes, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, subscribe to stuff, give us feedback. If you've got suggestions on the next movie we should do, you know, drop it in the comments or you can always email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.